Like a gigantic wedge, the Sinai Desert splits the head of the Red Sea, forming two gulfs. To the west, Suez. The east, the Gulf of Aqaba. And here, at the very southern tip of the Sinai, is the peninsula of Ras Muhammad, Arabic for Muhammad's head. Thrusting its thick fingers out into the sea, it stands as a sentinel, guarding the desert beyond. The land is harsh, a barren wilderness of granite and sand, a lifeless and empty region. Beginning a few inches beneath the surface is a rich mosaic, vitally alive and constantly changing. Thousands of different organisms bound together in a web of interdependence Brilliantly hued, each color significant, each pattern vitally important to survival. Around Ras Muhammad, the marine creatures have created an ideal environment for themselves where form and adaptation have reached perfection. Here, a natural balance exists. From the smallest microorganism and tiny fish, through huge schools of barracuda, to the hammerhead shark, Krov and Ann Menuhin spent nearly a year at Ras Mohammed. For them, it was a unique opportunity to have the chance to stay for so long in one place. At first, just the size of the area was a daunting prospect. But as they explored, there began to emerge a magic quality about Ras Mohammed and the seas around it. The reef was the focal point, and each dive became a surprise, for there was always something new. This, then, is the story of their stay and their discoveries on the reef. We pitched our camp at the base of Ras Muhammad, where a wide reef platform gave us a sheltered anchorage for our boat. It was an ideal location for our work, except for the heat. The temperature here would soar to over 50 degrees centigrade. Since we usually made two dives a day, during the hottest hours we would be on shore. Our first priority was shade. But despite the heat, we still had work to do and we soon developed a routine, first filling the tanks we'd used on the morning's dive, and then with the air compressor, shattering the desert silence, we'd reload cameras and charge batteries. All around the Menuhin's camp was evidence of old sea levels and coral reefs over two million years old. Embedded in the ancient sediment, are fossils of exactly the same corals that form the reef today. These tiny craters are the exterior skeleton of the minute coral animals called polyps, each an independent organism that reproduces itself exactly to form colonies. As they grow, they rebuild the base on which they sit, each coral species building a different way, and so the colony gets bigger. But its life is only a veneer on the surface. By early afternoon, we were ready to get back into the water and out of the intense heat. Most all our early dives were exploratory, studying the reef and trying to find suitable locations where we could film the corals and fish. We planned to begin very deep, at the lower limit of reef building corals. At the reef's crest, the corals grow profusely. Most of the reefs here are the fringing type, which follow the contours of the land as it drops away into the sea, in many cases, vertically. Occasionally, in shallower areas, 
the corals have formed islands just offshore, creating a miniature barrier reef around which tidal currents flow fast and treacherously. Within sight of Ras Muhammad, the bottom is over 2,000 feet deep. Out here, the surf is almost constant, having run unchecked for over a thousand miles. Certainly not an ideal place for small boats. As we fall weightless through the sea water from which all life on Earth evolved, Anne and I are time travelers. Beside us, the reef wall and all the corals are a prehistoric remnant. We are the privileged witness of life unchanged for over two million years. To one side of this canyon lies all of Arabia and the Middle East. To the other, Africa. This crevasse on the sea floor is a fault line at the bottom of the Great Rift Valley. I'm deeper than I've ever been before. The water cocoons me. As I go deeper, my powers of reasoning give way to a gentle euphoria. The depth takes me further away from the world I know with each meter. Reef-building corals cannot live much beyond 50 meters, for they depend upon sunlight. Here, branching gorgonians are the only life forms. At 86 meters, the deep sea will not tolerate us for long. Almost as soon as we've reached the bottom, we must begin our ascent. Between the crevasse and the base of the reef is an almost flat plateau of sand, broken here and there by blocks of coral that have fallen from the reef above. It's curious that in artificial light, these corals are so beautifully colored, like this alcinarian, a soft coral. The coral animal, or polyp, consists of a stem and mouth around which radiate tentacles. In the case of soft corals, eight. It's no wonder these corals were initially considered plants. This daisy coral would have to be a plant swaying with the current. Even knowing it to be an animal and a carnivore, I still find it hard to believe. There is a major difference, though, between the alcyonarians and the corals that actually construct the reef. Reef builders have six or multiples of six tentacles and secrete a hard limestone skeleton that is the basic construction of the reef. Here, the polyps are extended, feeding. But as Krov's hand passes over them, they retreat into their limestone base. A protective move, for they are the principal food of some reef fish. These are whip corals, commonly known as walking sticks, 
Their growth is upward, taking advantage of a wider band of water which carries them their nourishment in the form of microorganisms. They play host as well to other life forms, like these pearl oysters. To me, the grouper is the patriarch of the reef. Down here in these caves, he looks sinister and threatening, but I know he's mostly bluff. As soon as he sees I'm not going to move, he drifts away into his lair. As I follow the grouper inside the cavern, I become aware of the reef sounds. The noise is made by thousands of tiny crustacea. The deep reef caves are full of sponges, like this pipe sponge, which circulates water through its central cavity, filtering out its food. This magnificent red branch is a sponge as well, one of the many growth forms sponges have adopted. As Anne swims slowly up the reef, she comes across the most dominant feature of the deep reef landscape, a huge tree of black coral. Though reddish in the lights, its stems are a deep black ebony when brought to the surface. Because of its beauty and rarity, it has become very valuable. Our dive was over, but lingering in my mind is the color and diversity of what we've seen. It seems an evolutionary miracle that out of necessity, nature should have made so much beauty. As in most deserts, the Sinai sunsets are magnificent. The sky and clouds take on a reddish hue. And it could well have been its reflection in the water that gave the Red Sea its name. Ospreys thrive in this remote area. And this particular nest was not far from Krav and Anne's camp. The nest was occupied by a pair of birds and their chick, with occasional visits from the young of the year before. We reckon the chick to be about two weeks old. He was funny and awkward struggling about the nest. His elder brother, or possibly sister, would fly in every so often, but tended to stay away. If we approached, they would fly away, leaving the chick He'd adopt his frozen, I'm hiding posture. The fringing reef of Ras Muhammad is actually extending the land as the coral grows and dies and is filled in by sand and desert debris. In most places, the slope underwater is quite steep, about 45 degrees, but occasionally it drops absolutely vertically. These drop-offs are called walls and this particular one descends for well over 2,000 feet. All along the side of the wall is a veneer of small fish, venturing out only that distance which will allow a quick retreat back into the wall crevasses should a predator appear.
We'd come to the wall to look for the ocean fish and large predators, for here the deep water species come closest to the reef. Swimming out into the blue is a strange feeling. Once I'd lost sight of the wall, I had no reference points, no up or down. It must be very similar to being in outer space. I'd lose sight of Krov within a minute or so. It was a terrible feeling. One of the most common species of ocean fish we saw were the jacks. They'd come in at this time of the year to mate, the males turning gradually black to make their sex more visually apparent. Suddenly I became aware of the movement of something a good deal bigger than the jacks, a huge hammerhead shark. Instinctively, I felt no danger from this creature. My natural fear of sharks was somehow overcome, not by an effort on my part, but by sensing automatically that he posed no threat to me. What telegraphed this? Was it his movement or, or some more subtle communication? The slow, rhythmical movement of his gigantic tail gave no idea of the speed he was traveling, and it was all I could do to keep up. That Anne and I had come to a very special place, I no longer doubted. The cameras Krov uses are small, light and maneuverable, which he feels is vital to follow the constantly moving undersea world. By now, Krov and Anne had explored much of the deep reef and the wall. So, during part of their midday break, they decided to move into Ras Muhammad itself. The peninsula of Ras Muhammad has a distinct cut through its left side. This channel was caused by volcanic activity in the not too distant past. The channel is washed each day by the tide, which has filled in the original crack with silt and sand. The shallow and sheltered water is ideal for mangroves. In fact, these are the northernmost mangroves on Earth and must have entered the Red Sea from the Indian Ocean. The mangrove is a voyager and in its seed form can travel great distances before running aground and taking root. These are recently established roots and are the last place shorewards that sponges and corals colonize. What I find the most interesting about the mangroves is their ability to desalinate seawater. The salt comes out on the leaves. Perhaps sometime in the future that tiny molecule of DNA commanding that process could be incorporated into crop plants like rice, which could then be grown in salt water. If so, the mangroves could very well be the sea's most precious gift to man. For Krav and Anne, the principal job was diving. They had explored the deep reef, and now they would descend each day to where they'd left off on the dive before. A 
school of Naso, like a child's drawing of fish swim by. At 40 meters, Krov's lights illuminate the base of a giant sea fan, a species of Gorgonian. Here on the reef, many organisms take advantage of shelter provided by another, like this red sponge or the candy-striped hawkfish, blending in beautifully with the sea fan. The sea fans grow, spreading their branches across the current, so their diet of tiny larval fish eggs and plankton are brought to them. This is the great porous skeleton of Acropora, known commonly as umbrella coral. Here, at a depth of 30 meters, there is good sunlight, no wave action, and little current to hinder their growth. In these ideal circumstances, these corals will grow five or six inches per year. It was under these corals, in a small, almost self-sufficient world, that I began to understand the importance of diversity. Here there were fish, hard corals, soft corals, and sponges. It seems the greater the differences of color and form and feeding habits, the easier it is to maintain such tightly packed communities. The Acropora were destined to show us more about the reef than any other type of coral. Long ago, this Acropora died, but even in death it was recolonized. Tens, perhaps hundreds of different life forms settled and flourished on its branches. Death was no more than a brief moment in a continuous transition. This reborn world is fittingly capped by a brain coral, one of the slowest growing of the dense, hard reef-building corals. To keep the surface clean, the coral polyps secrete a mucus, which picks up sand and silt and carries it away. These are soft corals, sometimes called leather coral, definitely not reef builders. Their texture is very rubbery, and their polyps are like tiny white flowers. Potentially the greatest natural danger to the corals is the crown of thorn starfish. These have destroyed vast areas of Pacific Ocean Reef, but here they appear to live in balance with the rest of the life. Anne leaves the large Acroporus behind as she swims up the reef. Ahead, she sees a strange growth, a whip coral of gigantic proportions. I couldn't believe my eyes. Like a huge bedspring, this whip coral grew up out of the reef. The tiny white polyps that form this must have gone mad. In all our diving, we were never to see another like it.
As Anne continued up the reef, she found the remains of an ancient shipwreck. There, lying on the bottom, was an anchor and a large storage jar, an amphora. I had no idea where it came from or how long it had been down. What was surprising was the lack of coral growth. Usually, coral quickly colonizes new habitats. The only incrustation was this sponge. There were a number of others in the area, so it must have been a large cargo ship. This one had a bit more growth on it, but what was spectacular was a red sponge encrusting its side. I think it's the most brilliant red I've ever seen. Pillars of coral have grown up all around the amphora. It seems the coral has chosen this form to escape the sand and silt which cover the bottom. Each column is a microcosm of reef life. Tiny fish shelter in the branches of soft coral, while at the center is a core of hard reef-building coral. In the polyps of this coral, as in all reef builders, is the secret of their success. Millions of years ago, perhaps by accident, a microscopic plant found its way inside a coral polyp. The plant used the waste products of the coral and had shelter, and in turn gave the coral food and oxygen. Thus, a mutually benefiting relationship was formed. The lack of growth on the jars, the sandy bottom and pillars, all pointed to one of the most important elements inhibiting the growth of coral reef, sand. Some places along the coast, the sand comes to the water's edge and causes a sterile area. Even in places without much direct contact with the sand, we'd seen how coral needs to secrete a mucus to protect itself. We were curious to see where the sand came from. The origin of the sand was here in the high granite mountains of the Sinai. Over the ages, the granite has been eroded, the mica chips, the basis of the sand, blown north to what was once a flat rock plain. The sand arrived and formed dunes. Then, over millions of years, sea covered the dunes, impacting the sand and then receded, only to repeat the process time and again. For that reason, there are these layers, each one a chapter of a geological book going back into the dawn of time. Today, these sandstone cliffs are eroding. The erosion process begins when movement in the earth breaks off huge chunks. These pieces are then set upon by wind and occasionally rain, deeply etching the surface, carving beautiful patterns and tunneling elaborate galleries. With the wind behind it, the sand moves once again, forming dunes that march to the sea. Once underwater, the sand that had traveled from the center of the Sinai mixes with the sand that is the product of coral erosion and the waste matter of coral-eating fish, where it forms a habitat of its own, with animals specialized to live in it and from it. The triggerfish is one of the most visual uses of the sand habitat. Blowing it away in clouds, it searches for food, 
usually small crustacea or mollusks in the sand. Triggerfish have an evil disposition. Once that spine in its head is raised, which is why it's called the triggerfish, you've got to watch it. Those jaws can crush coral, and when he's annoyed or feels he's being bothered, he doesn't think twice about using them on a diver. As well as excavating the sand to find their food, they make these holes to lay their eggs in during spawning season. The reef is a huge place, and many of its larger species are quite elusive. So when I came across these two ribbon-tailed rays mating, I couldn't believe my luck. These rays are a part of the sand habitat and use it to hide in and feed from. A puffer fish tries desperately to maintain his dignity in the face of an attack by two small wrasse. Goatfish are bottom feeders. Feeling the coral and sand with their sensitive whiskers, they search out small shrimp and other crustacea that form their diet. The most magnificent fish that lives in this area is the lionfish. Their incredible markings are designed to lure fish towards their mouths, where they're sucked in. Their stripes are to confuse an enemy. Even the eyes are concealed by a marking, and so are the gills. The spines contain a poison that can seriously injure a man. In fact, all his color and form seem to shout, do not touch. Each butterfly fish carries his own national flag, which is his distinctive coloration. The most obvious reason is so that they can identify their own species for pairing and reproduction. They pair and live together, probably until one dies. They also maintain territories, and their flags tell fish of their own species not to trespass. As with many reef fish, nature has gone to great lengths to hide their eyes, their most vulnerable spot and has given them a coloration that either camouflages the eye or gives the enemy a brighter, bigger target, like this yellow flash on the French angelfish. Sea anemones are directly related to the coral polyps, only many times larger. They do not, however, secrete a limestone skeleton. The anemones have stinging cells which do not affect these damsel and clownfish. In fact, they live in a symbiosis keeping the anemone clean, occasionally feeding it, as well as acting as bait, attracting other fish into the stinging tentacles. I love the clownfish. They're so aptly named, though I admire their courage when they attack something as large as me. Far from being immobile, the anemone can retract in an instant if in danger. The moray eel is one of the most misunderstood animals on the reef. Though he's a strong predator, and I certainly would not want to be on his diet, I've never known them to be aggressive towards a diver. Occasionally, we'd find large green turtles on the seaward edge of the plateau. These are ocean travelers, 
and once a year the females find their way to local beaches where they lay their eggs. Like a magnificent shower of ice crystals, these tiny glassy sweepers guard the entrance to caves and overhangs all along the reef crest. They school by the thousands for survival, the school becoming the organism. One thousand pair of eyes are better than one, and if one or one hundred are eaten by a predator, the whole survives. Yet each fish is a distinct individual. Inside the reef is another world, an area whose surface can be three times larger than the exterior. It is vitally important to the survival of the reef, for here are found the bacteria which organically break down the sewage from the reef and regenerate nutrients. Here also are found many of the corals that grow only at great depths, for inside the reef are duplicated the same conditions of darkness and still water. I had to be very careful of where I put my hands, for one prick from the spines of this stonefish could be fatal. They're so confident of their camouflage and poison, they hardly ever move. The fish always tend to orient themselves to the nearest surface, for here there is no up or down. While Anne made her way towards the reef top from inside, Krov moved up the crest on the outside. At the crest, massive corals make the most of their symbiosis with the plants that live inside their polyps and lay down huge blocks of limestone. The grouper finds habitats all over the reef and thrives here at the crest, for this is the primary production area of the reef. These giant clams close, not from my touch, but when I block the light. Like the corals, they too have plants inside their cells. As my light swept around, I caught a movement just above me. It was an anglerfish dancing about, disturbed by my light. These strange fish hang a lure just above their mouth, and when a fish goes for the bait, they suck them in. Swimming up the crest, I feel more strongly than ever that even though each of these corals and fish look like an independent entity, they are not. Each one depends upon the other for food, shelter, and population survival. The reef is a single, massive organism whose parts are less important individually than the whole. These beautiful and delicate circles of lace are the eggs of a small marine snail. Surfacing, we were greeted by the ospreys out for their evening's dive. The ospreys out for their evening's fishing presage the sunset and the night when Krav and Anne return to the reef.
As night comes to the reef, the two million year old time machine that Croft and Anne have been traveling in during the day accelerates back into the very beginnings of life on Earth. 500 million years are covered as darkness becomes complete. When Britain and North America were covered by warm, shallow seas dotted with coral reefs, this feather star swam in the embryonic sea. The night is an eerie time. Your whole world is contained in the beam of your lamp. Most of the daytime fish are sleeping in the reef and become confused and disoriented when awoken, like this yellow boxfish. But night is the time of the echinoderms, and like most sea urchins, the slate pencil lives by eating the reef, as does the spiny urchin. This parrotfish is so sleepy I can even stroke its back, but not for long. His instincts warning him, he blunders off into Krov's camera. One of the most spectacular night creatures is another echinoderm, the basket starfish. Incredibly light sensitive, it folds its arms the minute our beams touch it. Known as the gorgon's head, its mass of sticky tentacles spread in the current, trapping the microplankton which it feeds on. The star of the night world has to be the Spanish dancer. This is a mollusk without a shell, a nudibranch. Even his gills are exposed, white feathery branches on his back. These are the Straits of Tehran, a few miles from Ras Muhammad, and are in constant use by a variety of ships, including super tankers. This ultra-modern 6,000 ton ship missed this channel marker by 150 meters, smashing up on the reef at 19 knots. In order to trim for the best speed with her load, she was traveling with her bow high. For this reason, she rode up on the reef causing both the reef and herself only superficial damage. Underwater, her propeller and rudder dwarf Krav and Anne. Cargo ships have sunk since man first went to sea, with little or no consequence to the marine life. Today, the oil tankers change all that. Directly below her grounded hull lay the cargo of another ship that had made exactly the same mistake. But far from damaging the reef, the reels of wire that made up the cargo have become a new habitat to be settled by all the reef organisms. These corals were the same as those we'd seen on the mangrove roots and are probably the first to colonize any new habitat.
Not far away was the wreckage of a steamer that had gone down 60 years ago. This ship had ceased to exist as a ship, having died a violent but quick death. Now it lives again in another form. It's become a habitat for the thousands of living creatures that make up the reef. Over the past months, Anne and I had learned so much from the reef, we felt we'd become part of the web of interdependence. We'd taken from the sea a knowledge, a sense of beauty, and a better understanding of our role in nature. In return, we must acknowledge our stewardship and responsibility for nature. We must understand that harmony, not exploitation, should be our goal, for ultimately, it's the condition of the natural world that reflects the state of man.